This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening. My name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer for the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. I would like to acknowledge that the land we meet on today is Ghana land and we wish to express our respect for the Ghana people, their elders and ancestors and acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship the Ghana people have with their traditional land. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia to our event with Jill Hicks, AM MBE, who will be in conversation with author and journalist Tori Shepherd. I would like to thank Jill, welcome Jill and thank you for taking time out of your incredibly busy fringe schedule and other work schedules to join us once again at the Hawke Centre and to also welcome back the fabulous Tori Shepherd. The Hawke Centre is committed to delivering a diverse program of free events and exhibitions throughout the year, which reflect our fundamental themes of strengthening our democracy, valuing our diversity and building our future. So, Jill Hicks, a published author, musician, artist and mother. Jill's appreciation and gratitude for life is present throughout all her creative works. She returned to Australia after 25 years in London, continuing her passion for communicating the importance of recognising our shared humanity by launching a new practice exploring music, art and narrative as powerful forms of universal language. Recognised and awarded for her work within the arts community and healthcare, Jill received both an MBE and an AM for her ongoing devotion to making a positive difference through her own adversity. Now, before we head into the In Conversation, um, we're going to show you a short film from Jill's wonderful friend show titled Still Alive and Kicking. Thank you. <laughs>
reports are just coming in of an explosion here in London. And there's just an explosion. Wow. Do you? <laughs> I was saying to you just before, it feels almost soothing, but you came up with the right word. It's more meditative. Yeah. You want to talk us through it? Absolutely. So what, what that piece of film uh, means to me is in the hour that we were waiting for rescue in the carriage after the explosion, which I had no idea what had happened, um, I had the most extraordinary experience of hovering between life and death. And... I only sort of talk about death in terms of its absolute beauty and how I've come to understand it, which is that it's not an ending, but another dimension of life. And death came to me as this beautiful voice and it said to me, you know, it, it told me that I'd lost both of my legs. And I remember thinking, what? You know, I feel no pain. The, whatever this voice is saying, this can't be true. And it was so beautiful and soothing that it was asking me to come. And I remember looking down to, to you know, where my legs would have been and I thought, gosh, this voice is right. It's telling me the right information. So I felt more convinced about following it. And in that space of time, the film of my life started to play and what really got to me is that in all the years I'd been in London I was an absolute committed workaholic so I was the person that was at my desk at 7 30 every morning and I'd be the last to leave at half 10 and you know I smoked and I drank and I had all of the trappings of that life and yet my film was this capturing of moments. And it was so important, the, the, the touching of a textile. I could smell perfume. Um, I could taste, you know, my favourite pasta. And the big thing that got to me was I, was I was brought up, I was born in Glenelg and brought up by the seashore. And the thing that really got to me whilst watching this film of my life was the absolute sense that I was back at the beach and almost that um, do you know and I don't know whether whether it still happens you can tell me if it does or not but I remember as a kid running on the hot sand and it's so hot that it burns the bottoms of your feet and you just have to really make a mad dash all the way to the ocean and that's what I was thinking about. I think it's only been getting hotter, unfortunately. So I don't, I don't, <laughs> I'd melt now. Yeah. <laughs> some plastic left on the, on the sand. You know. um, You're awfully chipper for someone who talked to death. <laughs> but, but it was beautiful. It was beautiful. And, and after seeing these, this sort of series of moments, and I, I kind of felt that I haven't had enough of that. Now that I know how important they are, my overwhelming sense was I want to actually have more of that. So I'm going to choose to take the, the more challenging option, which is to stay alive. And so you started your second life. So in exactly in that moment, it was, it was the beginning of a second life. In your first life, where do you reckon you would be by now? What was first I'd life? Still be, I would still vision. be in London. I'd probably mm -hmm. still be. I'd be in lockdown right mm -hmm. now, so I'd be frustrated. Um, look, it's hard. I think when you when you get when you live a life where you you allow you allow yourself to be overwhelmed by the your idea of what's important. And to me, I thought that what I was doing, and I worked in design. I thought I was working on the equivalent of curing cancer. You know, I really thought that it was, I was super important and I was 
doing something that was filled with purpose. Um, what really got to me was after six months of being gone from, the, from my work, I came back, I, w I came back in a wheelchair and everyone was a little bit kind of uh, perturbed at having to change the, um, the facilities because the disabled facilities were, was the closet. So that's where all the brooms and, and mops and everything were kept. And suddenly that, oh, got to... What, so they're like, we're going to have to design something. Now we've got something. someone in a wheelchair, you know. Um, so all of those... So I, they're, they're the things that I would never have noticed before. Um, and coming back, you know, I, I will never, ever forget that I went to a meeting. I had my, my you know, to-do list. And it literally had that little tiny bit of film of dust over it. And I thought, what? Do you mean I, no one's picked this up in six months? And this was like, you know, the Bible of And the design world didn't urgency. fall apart without the you. The design world didn't fall apart. But even worse, Tori, was I was going back to meetings that was the same meeting. So, you know, we all know that, don't we? Where, where it's sort of like, yeah, yeah, let's drill down on that. Let's action points five to seven. Were you worried that maybe you had died and you're in the bad place? <laughs> yeah. This is death. This is hell. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's, it's interesting when, you know, when you have that enlightenment, that sudden idea of you know exposure of what life really is about and then you go back and that I didn't need any more convincing I just said I'm out this is madness and um and off I went now tell me so we've spoken about enlightenment and another dimension were you religious before the attack um I'd say I was a very spiritual person I was brought up in a in a deeply religious family. Um, my mother, so I was with my mother when she died. My, both my parents died when I was quite young. And my mother died of pancreatic cancer. And so she had three months from diagnosis to, to oh, wow. passing. And I think for me, I was quite taken by her deep sense of, of faith that it made it such more of, a, of an easy coming to terms with um, because she trusted in this idea of, you know, God has taken me to heaven. Um, so I saw a beauty in, in, and a comfort in having something like that. Um, for me, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm more taken by the idea of nature and that an idea of God for me lives in everything that's beautiful around us. That is lovely. Mm, that's how I feel. And now you're in your second life. Do you want to give us a quick rundown of what you've been doing lately? And this is me <laughs> letting you plug your fringe show, so take full advantage. <laughs> um, well... I just so yes, yeah, so I've decided that um, after after the year that was last year, um, and life changed for for everybody in, in various ways. Um, I thought, well, let's do a couple of things that are completely mad. One of them was I picked up a, a, some clippers and I just shaved my hair off, and I thought, this is me having a, not only a tantrum, but but owning change. I felt that that sort of strong urge of. The whole world has changed around me, so I'm going to change me so I can confront this idea of extreme change head on. Um, was that about control? About Was that about seizing back a bit of control in the chaos? Ab ab yeah, absolutely. It's, it's controlling the things that I feel like that when you're in an uncontrollable environment mm. and also that I could look like G.I. Jane or G.I. <laughs> Jill and um, have a kind of a, you know, a... a, a a warlike approach or a military approach to how I would how I would. This is not very warlike. This is just moody and beautiful. <laughs> so, but nice try. I didn't have my car keys on. Right. Um, uh, yeah. So the, so there was that, and then I I thought actually the, the thing that that where my soul really comes alive is within music and art, and um, so the opportunity came 
almost by universal divinity of um, doing a friend show, but not just doing a friend show, doing 12 friend shows. And I remember when I was sort of composing it and creating it, and that half idea of, well, it's probably not going to happen, so it'll be fine, and off it all goes on the email. And, and then here we are, we've just done our first run. Um, and wow. Yeah. I think the first I heard of you doing a fringe show was when you made a ring with a QR code on it, which is genius. <laughs> I have a bag with, I, I just went QR code mm. mad. So I, I think what. Oh, I, not a COVID QR, just, just in case I wasn't clear, where you could just scan can it I, and it'll take you to book you a ticket at a show. What, what I felt. Um, instinctively was how hard it actually is. So it's not a given that you can sell out. Um, so we've just gone mad and made all of these <laughs> QR codes. So people think that I, I work for SA Health <laughs> and they try and check in wherever I am <laughs> and, then, and then find it a bit alarming when they find themselves at the Botanic Gardens in the <laughs> black box going, is this SA Health? Yes, you'll love it. It lasts an hour. It'll be, fine. it'll be fine. It's, it's the cure for all things. Um, so, I, I, you know, putting the design hat on, I just, I, I absolutely appreciated that it is not a given to be able to sell 12 shows out. Um, and how do we do this with, with a bit of fun, with some elegance, um, without trying to beat people down all the time? No one wants to be sold to. So you can imagine if I'm out and about with this and I've got the same thing on a ring and a necklace, it creates conversation. And then people feel a bit awkward. So if they've said oh, what's that ring you've got? And I say, oh, that's tickets to the show. And then you've got them. And then they can't say, <laughs> oh, well, I'll get that next time. It's like they're caught in the moment, so they have to sort of scan it and go, okay, well, I'll be seeing you on the night then. <laughs> Fantastic, bye. <laughs> Tell your friends. You know. um, so it's been, it's been a joy to talk about and sell in a completely different way. Yeah, I'm amazed everybody else didn't steal your idea, frankly. Um, and then more, most recently, I saw you invent a word to describe... <laughs> exorcited. Exorcited, is that yeah. how we're saying So it's it? not like exorcism. No. No. So it's exorcited, and, and it's, that, it's that sort of space where you are so completely exhausted because of the lead-up to doing all of these, you know, fringe, the madness starts before March, and then giving your all. So everything goes into what happens on that stage. But it's still incredibly exciting. And every moment as the lights go down and the show starts, I have this absolute overwhelming sense of what a privilege it is to be here and to, to share this, this space with such extraordinary musicians and, and, and communicate in a way that, that fits the soul. Yeah. Now onto much more serious topics. Do you mean that wasn't serious? <laughs> no, that was actually, that was reflective and lovely and philosophical. And now let's talk about violent extremism. Um, Not violent extremism, the show. No, no that's next fridge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. A musical? Yeah. Violent extremism, the musical? No. No. <laughs> All right, so the show is still alive and kicking everybody, but you don't even need to know that. You can just come and scan a bag. <laughs> um, so this has become a large part of your second life. Yeah. Do you think of it as your sort of second? I do, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I, for me, there's a very clear demarcation line. Um, there, it's only been recently that I've started to understand that I have been cheeky enough to, to draw the tentacles a little bit from the first life. So painting, singing, they're all the little strings of the first life. I still wear black. I used to wear black before, so there's part of me that feels comfortable in the second life. Um, equally, working in essentially the, the field of peace building, I find it kind of hysterical that I roll up always in black. And so I look like the sort of strange person in the corner of, you know, I don't belong in this party. <laughs> Do you think people are expecting a floaty caftan in I, many I don't, Yeah, and I just said, I'm, I don't even like lentils. I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Not even a whiff of patchouli. I know it's stereotypical, <laughs> yeah. But, 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 but interestingly, you know, what I did find was that for me, peace wasn't about the soft voices and the hugs and, and the beautiful sharing. To, for me, peace actually 
was pretty hard. It's like it, for us to make a commitment to say, um, imagine if we 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 went to peace with an idea of it being a verb as something we did. That's actually really challenging. That's hard to be the person to say, okay, I'm not going to ignite an argument. I will, I will agree to disagree. Um, I will respect you as a fellow human being. Um, let's break some bread together, even though I find your, your ideas very distasteful. That's, that, that takes an immense amount of confidence and posturing that um, um, I think we, we need to be teaching right from the word go mm. our, our children of how to do how to do peace because it's not easy. No, you'd never get anywhere in the internet comments with an attitude like that, would you? <laughs> no, I'm really bad in chat rooms. Yeah. <laughs> um, and of course, a lot of people would assume because of what happened to you yeah. that your focus is purely on Islamic terrorism, yeah. but that's not the case. Talk us through. What so, do you think about when you think about so, violent so extremism? So I, I didn't know what had happened. Um, I was I, I I was told when I was in hospital um, that this was a, a suicide bombing mission, that there were four bombs across London that morning. Um, I, I was just absolutely dismayed. You know, how, how could this be possible? And how, with eight million people commuting in London, how could I possibly be one of those people? Um, and it was the only day I was running late, so it was the only day that I wasn't in my office at 7.30. And I, and I sort of, after the, after the weeks passed, I then, uh, it took me a long time to be able to speak again. I'd lost uh, a lot of my lung capacity, my hearing, my speech. And so all of this had to be a, a, a learnt um, a, a sort of uh, action. And I asked, I want to know more about this person that did this. And, one of the questions that the, the, the police, in fact, asked was, you know, they're trying to gain witness statements, and did you see this person? And I said, the sad thing is, commuting in London, we are trained. There is an absolute unwritten rule where you do <laughs> not look at anyone, you no. don't talk to anyone, look and ridiculously, phone, people have got books like this. Mm -hmm. You can't read a book, and, and yet you're that close to the person next to you. And... I felt immediately the failings of being a human being because there was apparently one person between me and the suicide bomber and that person ultimately shielded my body and yet I couldn't tell you what he looked like. And I so wish that I'd looked up and said good morning or something, acknowledged his presence. Um, I now have the incredible grace of knowing his family, his wife, his children. Um, so I now feel I know him, um, but, but I wish I'd looked at his face. And so to me, there, there was already this, these sort of nuggets of, of insight of how we're conditioned as human beings and who we really are as human beings. And I felt that they, they're already out of step with each other. So there were these, these moments for me of already starting to recalibrate into an idea of I need to understand more about why this happened. And I remember looking at the picture of this guy. Uh, he was 19 at the time. And I was expecting to see this monster. And I looked at his face and thought, you're, you're just like uh, you, you don't look you don't look like a monster mm. you just look like someone that we would pass in the street there's a danger like isn't there in guy there's yeah. a danger isn't there in assuming someone's a monster because we other them we're making no yeah. attempt to understand yeah. what goes on yeah. and then we're ignoring yeah, yeah. and it was that out. moment that I because he's dead I can't go to him I can't have an exchange I can't ask why so therefore I I felt that I've got to somehow put the pieces together and I need to understand his motivation and then I need to grow that out. What are the motivations mm. of an ideology, of a set of ideas that can be so lethal that they would lead to this and they would lead to, to, 
taking another's life. Mm. Um, and that became the quest right from that moment in hospital. Do you believe in evil? No. No. I, I believe that, um, that and, it, and particularly because I've spent so much time in this space, I believe that people, particularly within extremism, um, people don't see the criminality in those actions that are doing them. They believe that what they are doing is fighting a cause or that they are righteous, especially if it's a religiously infused idea that they have God on their side and it's a righteous cause. That is why it's so difficult to dismantle that set of ideas. Um, anytime we get a collective of ideas that go against the grain of humanity, we are setting up for a very, very dangerous set of circumstances. Mm. I guess then what has happened recently, I'm just going to pull out this thing that you sent me earlier, which was serendipitously a story that came out today, which is that Australia is about to list its very first right-wing terrorist organisation. So I think we've got 33 banned organisations and they're pretty much all... Islamic, and there have been increasing questions about why right-wing extremists haven't been listed, particularly when you hear stories about um, you know, swastikas in the streets of regional Victoria towns and people seeing what happened in America and getting concerned about it here. Yeah. Was there a point where you swung and went, this has got to be part of the same fight that I'm fighting trying to understand Islamic terrorism? No, no I think it, it, was, it was always right on the agenda for me um, because as I started to get further and further into this world of extremism, I then started to meet former terrorists and some of those former terrorists were um, IRA or were alt-right or, you know, former skinheads. Or, so, so the former terrorist group then started to inform my knowledge of you know, the, the, the similarities of how people get led into the, the concocting of, of very lethal ideas and therefore ideologies and indeed how they come out of it. And we started to see all of these similarities and it was, it was just like, like solving a design puzzle of if, if we can see how people go in and how we can get them out then why isn't it far more simple for us to be safeguarding mm. in the first place? How do we build a confident society where we don't feel fear of the other and where we lessen all of the, all of the excuses of what starts to um, lead people into these extreme positions in the first place? Mm. And now you, you put me on to, and I'm having an absolute mental blank on his name, but the skinhead. The what? The skinhead. Yes. And what was his name again? Matt. Matt. And it was this extraordinary story. One of the main things I remember him saying is that when he was um, just starting to get, you know, interested in sort of the neo-Nazi world, you'd have to write off for a magazine once a month to then read up on it. And, of course, now, you know, so it took him, I think, a year or two years before he even started meeting other skinheads. And he said, but now you go on YouTube... It's everywhere. And it happens in a day. And I think it's pretty, it's very easy for us to dismiss all the little subtle nuances of things and then even the bigger glaring things. It's very easy for us to say, oh, well, that's just a gang culture or that's a phase or, you know, mm -hmm. and particularly even with, with, you know, with cloaked religious extremism to the outside world, that looks like someone who's suddenly found God and is a completely pious, you know. Um, so it, it, it's difficult for family and friends to find those little moments where they can sort of interrupt the pattern. Um, but but it's, it's how we need to be far better cued on, on oh, what's cued. going on. Oh, cued. Was that a cue? <laughs> <laughs> that was a QAnon joke. We'll come back to QAnon. <laughs> Sorry. Subtle. Yeah, like. <laughs> don't, don't listen to Q. Anyway. <laughs> if you had, you know, omnipotent, omniscient powers, what would you start to change to fight against, extra, you know, if you could control all these Silicon Valley companies, if you could... <sighs> 
get into people's brains and fiddle around with how they process information. What is there a couple okay. of big there's things? Two, th yeah, there are two. There's two things, um, and I don't want to sound like a like a uh, you know I'm on the spectrum of being too hippie, um, and I, I say this with absolute solid um, conviction that we need a lot more love. Um, and when I've talked to the former terrorists who have come out of a situation, the, the one thing that changed them was a seed of doubt, and that seed of doubt was planted through an action of love. And so I, I say it with absolute firmness that it is imperative that we have more and find ways to offer more environments that feel um, embracing, that feel that someone can be held. And through that, then we get to a place of feeling confident. Mm. When, you're, when you're loved and, um, and feeling like I'm understood, even if my ideas are different, then I can feel confident in expressing that. And I don't need to look for a silo to, to, to be validated back. I can be validated by my community and have, you know, pink hair. That says that's that's fine. You've got pink hair. We love you, and that's okay. Um, and it's it's how we get to that. I, you know, I'm 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 equally fascinated in, you know, in the human species of our evolution and and how do we evolve into this higher idea of being where we don't have to kill each other to prove a point. Um, you know, that's that's the big mm. that's the big question. Uh, th th there's something that really bothered me with the the well. There's many things that bothered me with the <laughs> July seven terrorists, but the, the one thing that was a great failing uh, that I felt was that on their suicide video, they explicitly said, you know, you're not listening to us, so we're going to make you listen through blood. And this is a direct, you know, action because of the invasion of Iraq. And when I've talked to um, others who are holding extreme beliefs, this is a point I often bring up because I said, well, that doesn't correlate with me because what we saw in the lead up to the Iraq war was unprecedented numbers of the general public mm. coming out who've never protested before. So there were elderly grandmas, there were you know, children, everyone was out, particularly in London. And that, so, so they had the support of the general public. So it never made sense to me of, well, why attack the very people? And if this is a righteous cause, surely you want the public with you. So, it, so that was a great failing in the argument for me and um, one that I often use as my little seed of doubt. Mm -hmm. The other thing for me is the power of not holding hatred and bitterness. Um, I, I, I park the idea of forgiveness. I don't forgive the action at all. Um, if this person was still alive today, I think I would be giving him a little swift kick with a prosthetic and then we'd speak peacefully. Um, just one kick, just, that's just it. A little, just a little Sounds light, pretty you know, forgiving to me. Just to say this <laughs> isn't okay um, because the, the, you know, this is ongoing for me and I think that that's the other sort of real testament to, to ha not harbouring hatred and bitterness because the pain and discomfort uh, continues. So it's not something you say, great, Here's some prosthetics, off you go. It's a continuing injury and a continuing reminder of, of what happens when people latch on to a set of ideas that are incredibly destructive. Um, so for me, I was, and my body was, when, throughout my rescue period, completely loved. And that's why I feel that I can sit here and be a testament to how powerful that is. Because even one young police officer that I've met all of my rescuers and one of them said to me, you know, I was trying to give you some of my life through my hand into yours. And I said to him, I felt that, I could feel that. Now, I want to place that in context with my body 
was horrifically burnt, um, terribly injured. I was given a name tag when I was uh, when I was arrived at hospital of being one unknown estimated female. So those four words alone tell us the picture of how dire I, the situation I was in. So for me to have felt incredible love and care from every single person that had my body, that's extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Um, and, and then I, I was told at the end of it that um, I was in fact dead for 30 minutes so an incredibly long time to not be present or to not be here. And how there was still this sense of we don't want to give up, we will not give up. So they kept resuscitating for three minutes, 30 seconds. For yeah. which we are all very grateful. Of which I'm here, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you particularly, I imagine. Well, I hope I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> I, keep, I keep checking for a pulse. Um, but but I, I just can't, I can't stress enough how that I believe that immense love not only saved my life that day, but it really has saved me from going into the depths of, of wanting retribution, revenge, feeling bitter, feeling hatred, you know, for, for feeling open enough to say, okay, I want to be part of the, of the betterment of a life continuing and not the destruction. I want to know how I can be part of the design of a process where this doesn't happen again. How do, how do I do that? And so I immediately went to the town in the north of England where three of the four bombers came from. And this was a small town called Beeston that was completely devastated. You know, to think this tiny little town in Leeds and the world's media had descended upon it. And there's all these families just saying, well, we had no idea. We can't believe this is our boys that have done this. And then for me to be there, you know, a year later, sitting with them and saying, what do we do together? How do we do this together? And, you know, there were lots of ideas that were sort of flowed, put on the table. And as a joke, I'd said to all of these community leaders, I said, well, maybe if I walked from Leeds down to London, you know, that'd be, that'd be a statement. And I thought they'd all be laughing at me. And they went, that's a brilliant idea, Jill. And I thought, oh, no, I, I didn't even own a tracksuit. You know, so yeah. I was just, oh, I wish I'd just shaved my hair. Training. <laughs> um, so, so it was a month on the road. Um, and we, we walked through towns. And my message was very clear. I just said, look, if I'm prepared, don't, please don't put any money in this. This is not to raise money. This is to, to get people to come together and to walk and to talk. And if we can do that, then hopefully we can address the issues that, that are separating us and find the way of, of having those epiphany moments to say, that's right, what we have in common is always far greater than what can divide us. You know, we've just got to keep finding the way. We do. And just to go back to when you said, you yeah, the bomber on your bus, you looked at him, he's not a monster. The sad truth is there are a lot of people who would look at anyone Islamic and see if not a monster, at least something, someone very different from themselves. So to flip that around then, what happens when a terrorist, possibly wearing Viking horns with a painted chest, or just a baseball cap, what happens when terrorists look just like us? That's it. That, this, is, this is our problem with society. Because, and then it's also a, a terrorist will not see themselves as a criminal. So therefore there isn't the, the, the hiding and the guilt and the feeling, well, I, I feel remorseful for my actions. A terrorist feels completely convicted uh, or, or, or courage of their conviction mm. um, that they are fighting some sort of cause. And this cause in particular obviously was, um, and by the way, I think the head of the FBI has declared that they were, they were terrorist acts in the capital in, in January. And I felt unsurprised to see it because I spend way too much time watching those Facebook groups. But I think a lot of people would have been kind of surprised that all this 
kooky conspiracy theory stuff about QAnon and about the election being stolen actually translated into action. Were you were you surprised or what? Not point? at all. No. no, no. So so watching it very carefully. Um, again, this is where we have to. Be, it's it's like how do we become the safeguards of of this growing snowball that is ideas upon ideas upon ideas that suddenly form, you know, the DNA strands of an ideology. Mm. And it happens just like that. So it's therefore, you know, the, the, I, coming back to the idea of peace, you know, it's, it's how, do we, how do we become the people at the dinner party or the people in the social event to say, actually, can I just stop you there with what you're talking about because that's factually incorrect. You know, that that takes courage. That takes confidence, and that also takes you know a sense where I, I know my facts. So how do we even know our facts? You know how because 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 extremism is very persuasive. Um, I've I've often used an example um, when I'm talking in, you know in a public realm of of. It, it, it is as easy as using susceptible language to susceptible ears. And I might say something like, in this room, um, did you hear all the blondes in the room? Did you hear what's happening in Victoria? They're killing blonde people. And, oh, you might think it was a car accident or you might think it was this or that. No, 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 it's a cover-up. They're actually trying to get rid of blondes in Victoria. Not a it's, real one, by the way. Yeah, thank okay. God, yeah. But it's only, it's only a matter of time. <laughs> before this will happen in South Australia. Mm. So blonde, blonde people, what are you doing about it? Mm. You know, we've got, to, we've got to fight this. And, you know, suddenly if you, if you have that, that lens of fear, suddenly everything you look at becomes then, is this water or is this some sort of poison? Because someone's water. To... So the lens of fear is actually very mm. powerful and, and it's how do we... How do we help alleviate fear in a society? Again, it comes for me through the ideas of how do we grow confidence. We, go, we, grow, we grow confidence through having facts. You know, we, we live in a very opinionated society and it's very hard to find the facts. It is. What about the politicians? Can we have a go at them? I mean, <laughs> it's an interesting... But it's too easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah, too yeah. easy. Fish in a yeah, barrel. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting time because we've got the vaccine rollout. We've heard a lot about <clears throat> the importance of, you know, stopping the spread of misinformation at this particular time. And yet, isn't it true that half the time politicians are giving a nod and a wink to misinformation, or in the case, obviously, of Craig Kelly and people like that going, going the full bore? Look, I, look. I don't know. I think. I think when we look at a, a political message, to me, it always comes back to chicken and egg. You know, is it is it because it's it's easy to have a public at, in a in a sense of fear because we want them to do this, or is it easy to have a public informed with this because we want them to do that? It's about you know ma manoeuvring a, a whole nation, um, and I think it's it's yeah, chicken and egg. Mm. Do we, are we a reflection of what we want or are they a reflection of what they would like us to do? There's still not a lot of leadership in there, though. <laughs> Again, you know, you're talking to, to spiritual me and I think, <laughs> I think leadership is about, how, you know, how we govern ourselves and our responsibility for, for what we do in life, what we say. Um, who are we at that dinner pa party table? Mm. Um, and how do we arm ourselves with, with information? Where do we get our sources of information? And that's diminishing. That's actually hard. You know, I, was, I was shocked um, to, to have the, the, the understanding of how many people did rely on Facebook for mm. their news. And, and I had to sort of take just a moment to say, that's, that's really interesting information for me and I need to understand that to be able to understand how better to help society gain information that's correct and not just in, you know, opinionated, you know, hearsay. I think it was 40%, something like that, which yeah. Yeah, I, was, I was astounded by that. And what about young people? 
young people. Yes, and misinformation. Yeah. How do you make them resilient? Look, the young, so to my that? daughter is eight. So this age group is fantastic because actually young people want to protect the world. They love their environment. They love each other. Um, they're completely, you know, in a in a in a surrounds of of justice and doing the right thing. So I think it, it, it you know, it changes when we want to feel acceptance. And I think that starts, you know, as we get into our teenage years of, I, I want to feel like I belong. So if I don't belong to you, then who do I belong to? Mm. And, and someone will come along and fill that gap. So, it, it, you know, it's just like the fear narrative. If, if, if the fear narrative is not shut down with a fact, with a growing sense of confidence, someone will come along and fill that gap. Um, there's always people that are looking for that opportunity and, you know, that's what we need as a society to be the embracers of. How organised are the people who are looking for those susceptible people? Very, very organised. This is business. Mm. Yeah, you know, extremism, ISIS is a business. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastically run, organised crime business that makes a lot of money. Mm. So it matters to them. Absolutely. If the press isn't talking about you know, terrorism or us and them, that's, that's their marketing. I've seen some of their marketing and it is schmick. Yeah. Some of those magazines yeah. they put out showing yeah. ISIS soldiers building ISIS, hospitals. ISIS used to have a, a, a colour, a four-colour magazine that was, that was published monthly mm. and it would have, you know, the, the, the first cover story was, you know, jihadists of the month and, the, <laughs> a, 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 look, to us... It was a know, page three jihadi wife. To us, it, it just, it's like, it, it is insanity, it's ridiculous. But, you know, it, it was, again, positioning them as the righteous players in a cause and it's, it's, it's easily done. And are the right wing, is that organised? Absolutely, and getting more organised. Mm -hmm. They're learning from each other. So extremism as a business model, you know, it absolutely picks up the tips from each other and learns from each other. That's a really scary thought. Yeah. Um, we haven't done a live thing in a while, so I kind of forgot <laughs> about this bit. But um, anyone got any questions? We have to be a little bit careful because we can't, <laughs> we can't necessarily crawl over people to hand a microphone. Um, I am perfectly happy to just keep on talking to Jill, but does, if, if anyone's got something bursting inside of them they want to ask, do you want to stick your hand up? Um, Jill, uh, no microphone. This is great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Katrina, took, your shoes up to, uh, took my feet, yes. Your feet. Yeah. Can you talk about yes, thank you for that. So, uh, again, it's, it's, it's being in a position where you can adapt your thinking and not come from a sense of loss and upset and, and, and feeling um, morose and sad about what's happened. I feel very much that I need to be honouring the fact that I'm here. And for me, honouring a sense of life is about doing as much as I possibly can with the life I have. Um, so I realised that I wasn't in any time soon going to climb Mount Everest, or do the Kokoda Trail. Um, I've been to, I've been to Mexico, all over the world. So the shell feet that I have, which are the two plastic shells that look a bit like feet, I paint their toenails. Um, they go over the titanium um, footrests. I've given them to travellers and said, I don't. The, the, the condition is, I don't have them back. They only come back to me on the July 7th anniversary every year. But apart from that, they have their own freedom and they've been all over the world. And they were on the, the last picture I got of them, they were in Mexico on a train. And there's the train driver with my two feet sort of <laughs> smiling. And I just thought, they're having a ball. You know, so, and, and the other sort of imposter thing I felt terrible about, but kind of not because it's in a frame on my wall, is I got a, a thing saying, you know, congratulations, Jill Hicks, you've climbed, you know, Mount Everest. And congratulations, Jill Hicks, you've just completed the Kokoda Trail. And I thought, well, I haven't really, but, you know, <laughs> um, the, 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 the plastic feet have. But it's, it's just gorgeous. Um, so it's, it's going to be a book. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, like so a coffee the, table yeah, with yeah, a picture, exactly. so that's so great. Yeah, it's going to become a book, yeah. 
Yeah, my, my <laughs> have feet will travel. Yeah. <laughs> um, have they had a quiet year? <laughs> they have had a quiet year. So I haven't got them back. So they are they are still um, in the Americas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hopefully they're okay with COVID. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, has anyone else got any questions? Are you being shy? Uh, up the back there. Can you, do you mind lifting your voice so we can hear you? All I'm going to do is I'm going to read a line, two lines on the screen. You developing your life to deterring animal from following a path of violent extremism and the destructive ideologies that seek divisive outcomes within our global societies. Do you feel that the last the events in America since November's presidential election have put your cause back a long way? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, for this last year, I've had to step away. So this has been the first year in 13 years that I have not done as much as I would normally do within the field of countering destructive narratives. Um, I went back to painting. I went back to creating music. Um, I tried to sort of soothe myself by saying, this is okay because it's still a language and it's still a way of communicating to people. I paint very much around the idea of humanity. Um, but it, but it, it got to me because I could, it's like seeing the world self-destruct all around you. Um, I, I've been privileged to even patch into a school in Damascus and I remember having to catch myself because in this one classroom in Damascus they had pro-Assad, um, pro-rebels uh, and then pro-ISIS and all of these kids would be at each other's throats and then have to sit down and do a lesson and, you know, having that conversation and then getting off the computer and being in, you know, beautiful South Australia, I, I really had to feel like, what, what is reality? You know, how is this really happening in the world in real time? And then seeing what was played out in America, it's, it's, it's soul destroying. Because again, coming back for me, the frustration I feel is that I've had the experience of I know who we really are. You know, my, my life was was changed and altered horrifically by one person, but my life was saved by many. And to, to, to have gone from this idea of being an unknown, where it, it absolutely did not matter what colour of my skin was, you know, whether I was male or female, what I believed, if I had money, no, you know, none of that mattered. That still is the core of my being. So any time I see that, you know, not played out to what I know we are. It, it, it hurts, it really hurts. And because I'm a mother, I'm responsible for, for ha developing the next generation. How worried are you about the spread of those ideas here? Do you think there's anything about Australia that is more resistant to that kind of... No, well, as we've seen in Victoria, someone in a supermarket with, you know, a swastika sticker on their shirt. It's just, and it's not funny. You know, it, it's not okay. It's not. It's 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 the beginnings of, of a very very destructive um, set of rules that we don't need. We just don't need. And 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 um, I think we need to be very aware of how easily that corrosive drip can happen um, within our societies. Do you think we're protected a little bit by? I heard someone argue this the other day. Protected a bit by compulsory voting. So our politicians don't have to go full Trumpian <laughs> to appeal to their base because everyone's perhaps, turning out. Perhaps. I, I don't know. I, I think it's something as a, within Australia we don't have to think about very much. And, 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 and yet you talk to anyone who, um, you know, ra racism is very much alive and well. Mm. Or I, I will call it otherness. You know, I, I think we, we, we find it very easy to other someone who doesn't necessarily you know, look like us or acts like us. And um, I'm hoping that this next generation we can, we can really do something about that and, and see each other as human beings first. We've got so much to contribute. 
I think, I think it's that for me of, again, coming from a place of confidence. It's sitting at the table and saying, oh, brilliant. And, and what can you contribute that's something I don't know about? Wow. You know, I don't fear you. I'm excited by your difference, you know, because you're going to add to my knowledge. You're going to add to my, my wisdom bank. Wow. And that, that's the position of confidence and not fear. All right, any more questions? Yeah, up there. And if you don't mind, sorry, just projecting a little, just not projecting onto anyone. <laughs> Aren't democratic societies responsible for the actions of their government, such as invasion of Iraq? Yeah, I didn't quite. So democratic governments, we elect them. Yeah. So are we as people responsible for their actions, such as the invasion of Iraq? Well, I, I think what we saw with the uh, incredible outpouring of um, the general public protesting against Iraq, I'd say no. Uh, that, was, that was a very, very, very uh, visible uh, outcry from people saying this doesn't, this doesn't feel right for us. Mm. It's an interesting facet of democracy, isn't it, though, mm. that we have to elect. We vote for someone holus bolus because we like this, this, and this, and you sometimes get a bit of a Trojan horse in there that you're unhappy with, and all you can do is punish them the next time. The next time, mm. yep. Hi, Anne. I think one of the kind of cornerstones of the way that Australia and America have defined that democracy is being around the idea of free speech, and that that was you know, became a value at a time in which the way that we transmitted information was very different. And given what you've spoken to tonight about ideologies and extremism at the beginning as the transfer of ideas, I think that this, that it, it, every time we speak about, you know, stamping out racism, then people say, but what about free speech? Or we talk about stopping the transmission of harmful ideas and people say, but then that censorship, which is against our values. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. I'm not really sure what my specific question I can translate that into yeah. a question. <laughs> Free speech gets pulled out to excuse yeah. absolutely, absolutely everything. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think the limits are on free speech? I, I, so I think, I think there's a couple of things. I was doing a whole piece of work around you can't bomb an idea. So this, this whole sort of plan of action of we'll go in and we'll bomb that and we'll bomb, you know, that out of existence doesn't happen. You know, an idea is, is more powerful than anything because it lives, it transfers, um, so you can't eradicate it. You've got to have, you know, for lack of better, better words, you've got to have a greater idea. You've got to have something that can stand up against that and say, but have you thought of this? And to me, that's, that's what we are lacking in, the, in focusing and concentrating on building this, what is the greater set of ideas to act as not only a deterrent, but to act as a greater attractor than this set of ideas, because you can't bomb that out of existence. Um, in terms of free speech, I think, I think, for lack of, we don't have the time, but I think this is a very good topic because free speech to me isn't free. We've had to fight for that. And it's precious, and 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 it's it deserves to be held with as much reverence as we can give it. So any time it's diluted with someone spewing hate and saying, "Well, it's my right to say that," that to me dilutes this incredible um, privilege that we have within our society to be free. So I feel very protective about. Um, the real notion of free speech and freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Um, to me, that doesn't mean a free licence to spew hate um, because, you know, I think we're better than that. So I would like to say I think we're better than that and, and, and from a place of betterment, we are absolutely then able to have free ideas and I'm able to then try and I could persuade you to say everyone with pink hair is going to rule the world and you can all shoot me down and just say, well, actually, Jill, that's rubbish. You know, um, but what, what a great exchange 
And what a great way to use our human, you know, our, our brilliance of, of humanity to be able to challenge each other's ideas intellectually and walk out saying, wow, that was fantastic. That rigor of mind, wow. Um, rather than saying, I'm right, you're wrong. And, um, you know, yeah, we get nowhere. So, to, yes, freedom, of, fr real freedom of speech is, it really means something for us to, you know, to hold dear. Well, Jill, I think people are going to walk out of here saying, wow, that was fantastic. All right, we're only going to have time for one more. Will you go for it? As a free nation, as a democratic nation, how do we control these uh, other countries that want to take over the countries? Understand the four corners, whether or not, and how do we control this? Okay, so um, he's asking, how do we, as a free and democratic nation, control or deal with, I guess, other countries that are more authoritarian and want to take over the world? He declined to name any. <laughs> I'm just going to editorialise and put in brackets there: China, Russia and North Korea, if it ever decides to lose the hermitude. Uh, but that was me, not him. <laughs> yeah, what do we do about... We can't. No. We can't. But what we can do is what we do really well and be better at what we do. Um, and it's a bit like the playground, isn't it, where you, know, you, you, you naturally gravitate towards people that are going to play nicely by your rules and share and do all those things. So it's, it's how do we build up a, a planet that share a set of ideas that work with us? And how do we then, you know, say to those, those who, who don't have the same set of ideas or the same set of ethics or whatever it is, that, you know, how do we all operate? Because we're all here on this one earth. Uh, but I don't think we can control it. Good answer. And diplomatic. <laughs> but that's true, yeah. True. Well, Jill, that's us done. Do you want to do wow. another quick hard pitch for your... So, so sadly, or well not sadly, brilliantly, the, the shows have sold out. Can't we look on, can't we watch the, it online? The, this, my friends, works a treat. <laughs> High demand. Um, so, so there are two opportunities to watch the show um, live streamed. And um, so you can go through the channels at, at Fringe and Fringe Ticks, and there's an option to watch from home. And it's um, live streamed for the 9th of March and the 14th of March. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Hey, everyone, if we can thank you. Yeah. Thank you.